Hi, everyone. Thanks for tuning in. Today's episode is about engineering change. At Husky, we believe our strength and ingenuity comes from diversity and learning from shared experiences. I'm pleased to welcome to our podcast two longtime women engineers at Husky to talk about their careers and what it's like to be part of such an exclusive group and why it's important for young women out there, our daughters, granddaughters, nieces, or even if you're mentoring a young woman, to not only pursue a career in the engineering industry, but also persevere. So without further ado, I have Vivian Chung from our Bolton, Ontario campus and Melanie Henderson from Milton, Vermont with me today. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Let's get right into it. So please tell us a little bit about your role at Husky. Vivian, why don't you get us started? I'm a project engineer to start with, and recently I actually kind of start with a, a slightly different roles. So I have um, a few of project engineers working with me or for me as a little team to support the, um, the all the functionality of the machine's operations and the regional service team and the regional managers. So uh, I've had a lot of different roles at my time here at Husky. Um, I'm stationed in the Milton plant. My current job title is Global Training Specialist. So uh, I'm part of the Hot Runners organization, the third party Hot Runners. And my job is to, well, I have a lot of jobs, but my, my main job is to uh, create training material for our new or our existing design group. Um, and then I create the training material, and then I teach local trainers on each one of our manufacturing campuses. So let's take a step back into history and think a little bit about when did you know that you wanted to join an engineering field or take on a role in engineering? My dad is an engineer, so he's a chemical engineer. And um, he's also a very handy person. He's always, you know, uh, very good with building and whatnot. So, you know, from the from my very smallest years, he was always involving me with um, the kinds of challenges that he was working with around the house. And, you know, he used to play games with me where, um, you know, just as a making conversation, he would hold something up and be like, about how big do you think this is? Eh, about three inches, about four inches, that's about a foot. Um, so, you know, he was sort of building it right into my childhood and he would do science experiments with uh, my brother and I as well at home just to be like, here, this is a cool thing. Let me, let's make a potato battery and, you know, stuff like that. So, um, so even from the earliest years, I was already started sort of being trained to think in that direction. So I wasn't like, um, you know, specific, especially good at math and science. Um, but again, my dad really stepped in in those years. So I remember distinctly being in sixth grade, so we had to move over to the middle school. So, uh, you know, plus you're, you're, you've got puberty, uh, you know, on set, which is all just weirdness. And I remember in sixth grade being like, and, and suddenly the math starts getting uh, more abstract in sixth grade as well. It's less counting on your fingers and, you know, drawing pictures and more decimals and things like that. And I remember starting to pull away and being like, I'm not smart enough. I can't do this. And my dad specifically, I remember his expression many, many times being like, yes, you can. Like, just take a deep breath and come on, let's keep going. So he was the one who, who sort of pushed me over that initial um, hesitation and, uh, and really gave me the confidence uh, that I needed all through my high school years to start, you know, even thinking about uh, uh, going to school for engineering. Great. Wow. Sounds like you had lots of encouragement along the way. So I'm always much better in, at school in science and arts so basically that means 50 percent of the courses is off my mind and then uh, when i start in uh, university i have to uh, move to uh, manitoba with my brother and i have no friends nobody over there and but my brother already has a bunch of friends and roommates and they are all in engineering so basically, I don't even need to think. And it's just like, it's almost like engineering is the only faculty that's open in that university. I have no other thoughts or never really think about anything else. It's just naturally get into that. And the next question is, which discipline do you want? Like computer, electrical, mechanical, and all that. And uh, just say, okay, uh, yeah, me mechanical science, okay. 
because not none of his friends are actually in mechanicals. I, I don't want to be too close to be monitored. So trying to get away and say, okay, I just joined mechanical engineering. I, I never think about whether that's um, going to be any issues or any thing that I have to overcome for that field just because it's less uh, female student there. Until, the, of course, when I first start day one, then I found out the challenge already that they only have one female washrooms in the first floor and then one female washroom on the sixth floor. So I'm pretty good. <laughs> and for that specific building, because it's so That's old, one way to keep so, you in the classroom. <laughs> but, um, th that's okay. It's just kind of train you have a much better, better control <laughs> in a way. Very diverse uh, starts in, in engineering and, and different approaches. You know, having your, your brother and his friends there versus having your, uh, your dad uh, as your sort of lead person to encourage you along the way. Um, and I was going to ask you who your role models were, but I think, Melanie, you answered that one for me when talking about your dad. In terms of, of school, was there any particular subject that you excelled at? I'm always into science, but the chemical or chemistry area is not good. Anything else seems to be okay with me. So I just say it very balanced in that way. I was okay with math and with science as well. I enjoyed the classes, but I didn't particularly excel at them, um, but did well enough that obviously I could pass. Um, so it was a little bit scary going into engineering because I was a little bit afraid that I was going to be just pigeonholed into doing nothing but, you know, calculus, um, which is not who I am. Um, I wanted a lot more color and a lot more interest. Um, but uh, what I started to focus on, the the concept that kind of kept me going in the, in the early days when I was deciding, especially when I was deciding which uh, engineering discipline to go into, I kept thinking about... Um, the animatronics at Disney and that an engineer had to make all of that stuff. And so basically that it didn't, just because you were doing engineering didn't mean that it had to be dull and gray and, you know, dreary and just lists of numbers. There could be magic, there could be color, there could be um, whimsy as well uh, baked into the engineering process. So that's where my initial thoughts were. And, and, uh, and then, yeah, I chose mechanical engineering as well mainly because uh, working with my hands made sense, um, whereas I don't have like a, a, uh, an intuitive feel for like electricity, for example. Um, and, you know, chemistry was okay, but it wasn't like amazing. So, um, but being able to make things, especially like make art with my hands, that, that made sense to me. And so, uh, so that's where I went into mechanical. So if we look at your careers now, what are some interesting or rewarding projects that you've had the opportunity to work on uh, during your time at Husky? Vivian, did you want to start? So interesting project, I think when we launched the, um, the multi-layer uh, product line for the uh, theme wall uh, system, that's uh, very interesting and challenging because that is the very first system that we trying to launch in um, from the uh, time that we received a uh, go ahead from the customer to the time that we actually make it become a production worthy system, it takes less than um, a, a year uh, from a kind of like a development engineering project to a production system. So timeline wise is challenge and yeah, it's always a lot of um, unknowns as a first system that the, the customer understand that it's kind of, uh, okay, you need development uh, support and all that. But in their eyes is I pay money for this, I better make sure that it works. So that's some of the uh, challenge. Lots of pressure there, it sounds like. Uh, yeah, actually people, thrive with stress and all that right so i just say just take it and then once you get to a certain stage or you reach some milestone then that's your reward right great that's a good way of looking at it a positive way of looking at it yeah you don't want to be just sitting down there and doing the same thing again and again every day i guess that's one of the uh um 
advantage of in the engineering field because every day can be different. Even though you may be saying that you're doing the same job or same role for years, but every day you learn something new. You cannot be. That's not one day that I can walk out of the office without saying, "Oh, this is new to me." That's great. That's great inspiration for our listeners. Thanks, Vivian. So I've worked for Husky for for twenty one years, and I've had a lot of different、uh, a lot of different roles, and like each role has you know some sort of crowning achievement kind of thing. <laughs> so when I first started at Husky, I was a, a designer. I designed Hot Runners for a year and a half. And then I became the local trainer here、uh, in the Milton campus, and I developed.、Um, and that was one of those moments where、um, they kind of realized that they had a problem, and they weren't really sure how to deal with it. And that was when I sort of raised my hand and was like, "Me, me, ooh, I want to be the trainer. <laughs> Let me take this on." And、uh, and I started to create a, a cohesive training program that I was very proud of at the time.、Um, and then I became a mobile-based designer and.、Uh, My last mold base that I designed was this like enormous system. I mean, it was just for one customer. It was actually to make the、um, the Yuhu caps. <laughs> so, you know, like they have that sort of like mushroom sort of look to them, right?、Um, it was this really complicated mold. It was like eighteen plates all stacked up and、um, with rotating parts and moving parts and cams and and、uh, and a lot of complexity to it and. And it was profitable, which was actually not all that common for most mold-based systems. Usually, like they're lucky if they break even, but that one actually made a profit, and I was super proud of it.、Um, and then、uh, I moved on, and I, I was in the standards role, so that's uh, standardizing uh, internal uh, components and, and keeping drawings up to date and things like that.、Um, and then、uh, I had babies. And then、uh, <laughs> took a little time, and then came back and worked in product development for a little bit. And when I was working in product development, I wasn't developing new product. I was、um, I was really supporting the service teams, if you will, and helping them troubleshoot things that had gone wrong out in the field.、Um, and I had one project that was、uh, it was a really big deal. It was a, a system for Amcor, which is one of our large、uh, one of our large customers. And they were trying to manufacture these little white pill bottles, and the problem with white resin is that it's really, really、uh, abrasive, and so it'll scrape. If there's any junk inside of the system, it'll scrape it out, and because it's white, it shows it up really clearly. <laughs> so、um, this one really large customer was having a problem with,、uh, with with something that they thought was burning. And、um, I was able to work with our service team and、uh, go out to the field and visit the customer and do a lot of analysis and a lot of testing and finally determined what the actual problem was,、uh, which was it was、um, it was、uh, manufacturing residue, and was able to start developing processes with manufacturing to、uh, try and address the the residue problems,、um, find better ways to clean things like that.、Um, And then after product development, then I took on this role. So I've actually been in in my my global training role for twelve years.、Um, and、um, but what keeps me going in this role is is just as Vivian said, it's 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 different all the time.、Uh, so a lot of the time, you know, I'm creating training material. I'm I'm、uh, playing with new types of software so that I can、uh, create cooler and cooler.、Um, Presentations and animations to explain to my users how the systems work.、Um, but in addition to that,、uh, a few years ago, I got to be a part of a team to、um, streamline、uh, our our thermal FEA analysis process. And、um, before that, we had been doing the designers had been doing running thermal FEAs. Uh, but it was really lengthy. Like it could take like up to two days on a big system to do an FEA,、um, and uh, so I took on the role of being the business analyst and the product development engineer.、Um, so I was,、uh, and also working with the FEA team,、um, uh, which is a global team, but working back and forth with them to come up with solutions on ways that we could actually.、Um, Take that process and bring it down to production speeds. So we developed、um, software working with an external vendor and with internal IT, and、um, and I I was kind of driving that show and、um, and and did all of the testing and all of the validation and and eventually got down to the thermal、uh, to Annex Thermal, which is what the program is called. It's、um, it's 
it's not as, uh, it's not, you know, 100% elegant. It's, it's got some quirks. <laughs> uh, I have to help users sometimes to, to get through here, especially they're really complicated systems. But it's been in production for seven years now. And, you know, it took a thermal FEA from like, say, four hours down to uh, the shortest ones can be uh, as little as 20 minutes. So, so that was a big um, success story at the time. And then I'll have one more. So my most recent one, um, we have in Hot Runners, we have three analysis tools that um, uh, help us size the melt channels inside of the manifold, uh, help us ensure that the manifold will be strong enough to handle the pressures and help us ensure that the manifold will seal in, uh, that it won't leak resin everywhere in hot condition. So we had these three analysis tools that were ancient. They were so old and they were starting to uh, really sort of outgrow the um, the capabilities of what we needed to do. In other words, it had been designed when we had a very small product line. And as over, over time, product development added more and more and more products and the tools couldn't keep up. So uh, we had to create, so they agreed to make a, a new single streamlined analysis tool. And I got involved uh, in the second stage. Um, and at that point, unfortunately, the product development resources were starting to be pulled away and the, and the project was actually starting to be a little bit in jeopardy. Um, but I was able to step in and I took over the role of, of uh, not only, I was originally supposed to just do the training, but I actually ended up stepping in to, uh, to review the data, to start inserting the data into all of the systems, to start building all of the logic, to do all of the testing, um, to provide feedback to our external vendors, um, and then eventually to do the actual training and to roll it out to all the users worldwide. So those tools have now been in uh, production for four years, and it's called Newton. And um, and it's really the heart of the it's 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 the heart of the hot runner. It's what ensures that the hot runner meets our guarantees. Um, and and it works. And I'm super proud of it. <laughs> It's really interesting to hear both of your journeys and and how different uh, I think the engineering discipline can be uh, in different ways that you can you know apply what you know and what you learn every day uh, you know to bring that uh, to whether it's you know internal husky processes or ultimately to you know Vivian and your role to our customers. So thanks for sharing, ladies. If we look at some of the statistics um, that we hear today, there's a statistic that tells us that 40% of women either quit or never make even make it into the engineering field. Has that ever crossed your mind? And if so, tell me a little bit more about why did you stick it out and, and what's kept you uh, in engineering all this time? For me, I never really have any hard time or question or why I should leave this field, I it just never come across my mind that what's the difference. Like if you get into this field, any any field, any job, any career path, you are going to have uh, roadblocks anyways. So I just cannot see any reasons that I have to switch or quit. You just like a do uh a dobos, just keep going, and then until the roadblocks are gone. So, so sorry, it's going to be a short answer to your question, just because I never thought about that. <laughs> no, it's, it's a great answer. And, and, you know, I appreciate your honesty. If you, you know, you're the type of person that keeps going and doesn't quit, then, you know, certainly uh, perseverance is, is one of the qualities that I think, you know, for women in engineering, it, it sounds like it's important. And it sounds like, you know, that's a, it's a skill that you've worked on probably to hone throughout your entire career uh, so but far. You with know, Husky. On, to add to that, actually, you know, uh, sometimes you can see that Maybe people will say, okay, being a, a, a female engineer in the field with all this male is a disadvantage. Or, but I, I see it as an advantage. I kind of take, take advantage of that all the time, actually. <laughs> Even as simple as <laughs> there, you're laughing. Now you need to tell us more. Now I'm thinking about this situation. Even as like sharing facilities in a building that's full of female, I have my own washroom. I used to have my own store that I go in. This is my spot. <laughs> Set up the way that I like it. Because <laughs> that's not enough um, <laughs> female to share the washroom in this case. So I'm very happy to have my quiet own personal space <laughs> in that case. But putting all the jokes aside, 
uh, basically, it, it, people will see eventually whether you can perform or deliver through their eyes. It doesn't matter at the end. Like, th- of course, you have some stereotype. It still happens now, but it's more so f- for like even 15, 20 years uh, ago when I start. I have uh, talked to customers as in Asia, especially in Asia. They never know well, whether Vivian is a, a man or a, a woman until they kind of hear the voices and they are always surprised. I do have customers actually come to me and ask, oh, why why are you are working? I said, what do you mean by why am I working? Shouldn't you be like is I think you're married. Shouldn't you be staying home and you know? I don't get offended by all those questions, but I just kind of kind of surprised and oh, where do you come from? <laughs> why you have these questions? But it's just a different culture, right? Back in the those days. And now Absolutely. It's not as, uh, you don't get that type of questions very often. I think people start kind of open up and kind of accept the fact that, yeah, it's just a job. Anyone can do it. It's not like very physically demanding work that you have to pass certain tests. As long as internationally you can do it, you can do it. So that's that's really encouraging, Vivian. I appreciate that point of view. I think that, you know, for, for young women looking to get into the field, I think that, you know, to your point, 15 or 20 years ago, things have certainly changed and the perspectives are, are very different. But I like your uh, can-do attitude around, uh, you know, your approach to uh, that anyone can really do it. Yeah. So I have had times when I've, I've considered um, getting out of engineering and doing something else. And actually my two, my two best friends from college, um, both were engineers and one is now a marketing executive and the other is now a, uh, a professor at, uni- at the university of Vermont. So, um, now their engineering backgrounds still serve them well in their current roles. Um, and it helps them to grow and, and, and definitely still brings, a. a a level of, of science and logic to everything that they do. But yeah, they, they sort of were like, okay, I did this thing. This isn't really who I am and I'm going to go and try something else. Um, for me, um, you know, definitely, uh, when I took time off to have children and then came back, um, to work, you know, that was, that was challenging. That was difficult mixing everything in and, and, and finding that balance and making sure that I was both a good employee and also a good mom, because both are important. Um, so what keeps me here, um, and the reasons why I chose to come back, you hear the phrase of work family, and I really do have a work family with my my own team, and then also like also my husband's team. So uh, as a weird fact, my husband works here at Husky. Um, we met at Husky. Um, he actually sits about 20 feet away from me and we, we actually chat a lot. (laughs) Um, we're not on the same team, but, but our two teams have a lot to do with each other. So we're actually constantly consulting with each other. Um, and so it's that camaraderie and, and, and the, the joy of, of being with people that you, and that you enjoy hanging out with on a daily basis that, that keeps me here. That's exciting. I had no idea about your connection at work. So you have yeah. <laughs> uh, a work husband and home husband, and it's all the same person. <laughs> Can I just say, he uh, he actually checked my first project. <laughs> <laughs> and you made it and look where you are now. That's interesting that you, uh, that you also uh, work on teams that uh, work together. So that cre- certainly creates an interesting dynamic, I'm sure, both at home and at work. So Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Thanks for sharing, Melanie. Um, I, I think if we look at the field of engineering uh, since when you first joined to sort of today, um, in your experience, how has the attitude towards women in the field changed in you know the engineering discipline? I think uh, I kind of mentioned that for my previous uh, answer. People did change over time. And so basically, I think just because we have more um, female engineer engaged in the field, it's more like people see the result. They see what uh, being a female as an engineer can deliver. It's not like just a pity face showing up and do nothing. 
So at the end of the day, everyone's looking for result. So if you prove that you can deliver, you can you qualify for the job, then people will usually will let their stereotype gone a bit. But again, they are still, I would say, a small very small percentage of people in in the field are um, still very skeptical. They kind of just say, okay, let's see when she's going to quit, when you, she's going to fail, something like that. So it's too bad that it's not like 100% gone with that stereotyping, but it's uh, actually I can see that it's, it's improving in terms of the acceptance. No, I agree with Vivian. I mean, the vast majority of experiences that I've had are, if you can do the job, people really don't care about, you know, where you're coming from or, um, you know, if you're a woman or if you're a minority, what they're looking for is results. So if we look at uh, your perspective on why you think it's important for more women to join engineering um, as a field uh, of study or as a job, uh, career choice, what might that be? I think that it's generally, um, it is nice to have a certain amount of, of uh, camaraderie, if you will. Um, so I get along very well with all of my, uh, with all of my male colleagues. I kind of have to, because most of them are male. <laughs> but we have a great time. It's okay. Um, but when I do have those few female engineers, it's so nice to be able to just uh, sit down and share experiences and, and compare notes and sometimes just take a deep breath and, and sort of let your hair down and realize you know, acknowledge to each other that there is um, that there is stress, there are pressures um, that are unique for a woman, um, and uh, and and just you know have that sort of shared experience. I guess uh, first of all, you just need to look at the um, talent pool in general. If you have fifty percent of a pop- population that you rule out as uh, good resources to get yours talent employers, uh, employees uh, with a proper skill set, you're missing out a lot. And of course, I agree with totally with Melanie that like different looking at things with different perspective just because of your background and uh, no gender difference and all that actually helps in terms of solutioning. So I just cannot see why What's a disadvantage, let's put it in that way, without female in the field? You just need to make sure that all the girls are, are there and then, yeah, don't be scared and just venture out. I mean, you may hit some roadblocks, but as I said before, any career, any field, you have roadblocks. So just don't be too hard on yourself and don't even think about it. Just like day-to-day work, just go. The more you think about it, you say, when I'm going to be ready, then you'll never be ready. It's just like having kids, the same thing. That's a great perspective. Thanks, Vivian. Actually, you almost answered my last question uh, with our time together um, today. I think I contemplated between two questions, and one of them I think you answered, Vivian, but you know, looking at what's the main message you want uh, listeners to take away from our episode and our time together today, um, you, know, you can answer it one way or the other. I always think that if you looked back to your past and think, what would I tell my 18-year-old self, um, you know, or what you know, is the main message you want uh, listeners to take away. I'll let you choose how you answer it. But certainly, you know, um, probably today you're, the experience that you've both gained in, in, in your roles and I think the diversity of both of your roles certainly offers our listeners perspective about, you know, being in one role for a long time with diversity and projects and another uh, opportunity where you've had the chance to move around and uh, take some time off and come back. Um, you know, in retrospect, you know, what advice might you give some of our listeners today as we, as we close out our time together? I would definitely say, you know, uh, encourage your girls, um, your daughters and granddaughters and whatnot to, you know, consider engineering um, and and don't be afraid. Uh, there's, it, it may seem, uh, you know, uh, I think sometimes we can defeat ourselves before we've even gotten started. So um, don't think that because it looks like the person next to you just instinctively knows what he's doing, that isn't necessarily the case. Take a deep breath believe in yourself 
<laughs> and um, and yeah, um, go go forth and try things. Um, I would also say uh, definitely be true to yourself. Um, so again, I'm not a you know stack of. I'm not interested in a gray world where it's all just uh, you know calculations and and boring. <laughs> I am a colorful person. Um, I like uh, I like to have uh, a lot of fun with what I do, um, and so definitely you know think about who you are as a person and what sorts of things you enjoy. There's lots and lots of different engineering disciplines um, that can that can tie into all kinds of. of uh, interest in your background. One piece of advice that I got when I was first starting my engineering career here at Husky, which was really, really, really good advice, was um, go out and talk to the people who build it. So we kind of have this impression when we're in engineering school um, or in university that the people that you learn from are professor types. You know, we sort of have this sort of uh, uh, impression that they have to have many degrees or, or many, many years of experience within engineering in order to have valuable information. But that really isn't true. Uh, a lot of the best learning that I did was when I went out and spoke to the people who actually built my systems. The other thing, too, is that when you do go down and chat with the people who build your systems um, and get to know them and, and get to know them as people and, and really listen to their feedback, they will also help you out when things don't go well. So if, if there is uh, like something is late on the bill of material or there's a mistake on the drawing and they just need to fix it, they will work with you very closely because the, you're because you're now friends with them mm -hmm. and they will help you. They will help you come to timely solutions instead of uh, being a roadblock and being like, well, all right, how are you going to fix it? So um Go down and talk to the people who are actually building the systems. You can learn so much from them, and um, and it really will just improve uh, the work that you do. That's great. It sounds like building relationships is pretty key to uh, your success as well, Melanie. Absolutely. Thanks for sharing yeah. that. Okay. Yeah. And Vivian, what's your piece of advice? Actually, you know what? I totally agree with whatever that Madeline has said before. It's actually very, very important to develop um support and report from the the team that you're working with and that need me to think of uh, one of the uh, advantage of being being a female in a way because we ask questions all the time and then look at the the other half that never asked for directions i saw that all the time if i go into on the shop floor with someone else that's kind of next to me and I say, okay, I don't think you understand. I was thinking, but aren't you going to ask? Oh, no, you can't just because you cannot ask a question to show that you don't understand. At the end of the day, I got way more out of me asking what they think is stupid questions and learn a lot. And then the people are willing to actually, they will, you'll be surprised when you ask for something that you think is so trivial. But for them, they say, yeah, I totally understand why you asked that. Let me explain to you. But most of the time that I saw is, okay, they, the others are more like reserve or conserve and they don't want to ask questions. It's just like, okay, all, all my ego is gone. If It's just because I asked that one question. But that's actually important. Just go and ask if you don't know. If I know everything, I will not be in the same position now. Every day you have something to learn. So... Just no stupid questions. Great advice. Well, I want to thank you both for joining me today. I think you both shared some amazing insights into what it's like to be a woman in engineering and working at Husky um, for the length of time that you've both been at Husky. So I want to thank you for your valuable insights uh, and advice. And I'm sure that our listeners have enjoyed hearing today the perspectives uh, from both of you and what it means to be uh, a woman in engineering. So thanks for joining us today on Beyond the Mold. Mm -hmm.